Fortune 500 companies trust Interoptic for optical transceivers and cables. Since 2004, Interoptic has provided high-performance optics and cables at a fraction of the cost of OEM gear. Interoptic products are 100% tested and backed up by real engineers. Work with the optics experts at Interoptic. Find out more at interoptic.com slash packet pushers. Welcome to Heavy Networking, the flagship podcast of the Packet Pushers Podcast Network. And this week, Drew and I are at AutoCon Zero, a conference put on by the Network Automation Forum. This is the inaugural event of the Network Automation Forum, and there's over 350 people here, Drew. Good turnout for a first, first-time first event. And some of the folks that showed up are from New York Presbyterian Hospital, and uh, Mark Turkson and Pradeep Reddy Gorhala. I, I don't even know if I'm close, Pradeep, but I, I, try, I tried. And, and Max Durpin are here. They represent different areas of the New York Presbyterian Hospital, and they are on different places in their network automation journey. And so what we wanted to do in this podcast here at Autocon Zero was chat with them about how things are going, the challenges that they're facing, and see what lessons they might have learned that they can share with the rest of you. So, so Mark, let me start with you. Um, share with us where you guys are at in your automation journey. Thanks, Ethan. So, yeah, we've basically been on an automation journey for the better part of, I would say, 15 to 20 years. It started out way back in the day where we were just wanting to ensure our configurations were backed up properly and we'd have a, something to restore from. Since then, our network has grown tremendously. We have various different platforms and automation that comes from those platforms, and we're all at different levels of that. So you can have, you know, we went from backing up configurations to checking them for policy compliance configurations to modifying very easy, trustworthy things that we can change just when we find a device out of compliance. So that's kind of where we are on the, the campus side of things. So, th so there's more to it than just the campus side of things. You guys have uh, a multi-segment network then. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. The, the, our, our wireless and SD-WAN side of the house is um, a much different animal, much different technology. Our data center side of the house, once again, different design from our three-tier network, hierarchical three-tier network in the campus side is different from the fabric that we have in the data center side. And so the challenges there are much different than what we have on the other side. Okay. Max, I know you're working with one of those other segments. So what, what, what segment of the network do you represent? So I work on the uh, wireless and SD-WAN side. Uh, we've deployed SD-WAN for our branch clinics. So uh, we're currently in progress of migrating uh, our branch clinics uh, from uh, sort of campus environments to an, to an SD-WAN side where we can control uh, the uplinks. And uh, with that, we are... Um, you know, slowly getting into an automation area. Um, we do um, have uh, templates that we push to our switches and our gateways um, for those branch clinics. So that has that has helped somewhat. Um, on our main campus wireless side, there's very little automation uh, on that side. Uh, and we have quite, quite a few number of devices, um, upwards of, of 50,000 devices um, on that side of the house. Wow. Devices as in endpoints that you're supporting or the number of devices that make up the Wi-Fi network? Uh, endpoints. Okay. okay. So that would include both corporate devices and uh, medical devices as well. Okay. Now, you also mentioned managing switches. So when you say that on the, the SD-WAN side of the house, that wasn't what I expected initially because it doesn't have to. It, it could just be you're an overlay and you kind of don't care what the switches are, but that's part of where you're terminating tunnels, something like that, or? Yeah, so the gateways do, the routers uh, do terminate um, all the, we have tunnels from uh, the switches. So everything is tunneled to the front end gateway, and then it is sent um, over those IPsec tunnels to our data centers. Okay. Okay. Now, uh, Pradeep, what, uh, what area of the network do you represent? Yeah, hi. Um, so I, I represent the, the data center segment of uh, New York Presbyterian, and uh, fortunately, um, We've been on this uh, automation journey with, uh, with obviously with the support from the the, the network vendor. So we built uh, and two data centers that we have are mostly uh, you know greenfield deployments. But then we also uh, touch up on uh, a brownfield deployment that we had. Basically, we had to retrofit a, a, a data center that was already deployed, but then retrofit into uh, the automation automation journey, and that was that was a little challenging because there wasn't uh, obviously vendor support to, to do that. 
um, but uh, that's that's the journey that we've been on. But also that uh, the journey itself has been uh, like multi multi pronged, uh, where we one one data center deployment was strictly with Python scripts. Um, the whole data center was deployed, or you know, the script is uh, script can be used to deploy 120 racks in the data center. Um, but um, the other data center was pretty new, newly deployed. Was was vendor plat, you know, a, a, a tool that vendor gave us that pretty much deploys uh, 100 racks in the data center. Um, but we we are we're not on a, um, a the, the journey has been a little uh, iffy. But we want to be on the right journey where we can use the the principles of automation to be uh, you know segment agnostic whether it's campus, data center, or wireless. And your data center supporting healthcare applications, business applications? Yes, yes. Uh, and is there custom development that happens? Are you buying applications off the shelf? Like what? It's software off the shelf, yeah. Most of the applications are, are um, you know, that, you know, this already pre-written by the vendors out there. Okay. It's nothing, I don't think there isn't much of a in-house development. So one of the things we've been talking about here at Autocon is sort of the, the reason for network automation, why to do it. We hear people talking about efficiency. We hear people talking about velocity, like they need to keep up with the developers and so on. What What is your motivation for uh, automation? I mean, ultimately, I think that in a healthcare setting, you know, the, the, the patients are our are, are main focus. Right. So if we can provide a stable foundation to run the various medical applications and medical devices that are are present on our network that will lower the the risk profile for what we're providing to the rest of the enterprise and which in turn increases the potential outcome for a, a good result in patient care so you're looking essentially for a stable network and the idea is that automation will help you achieve that stable network? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Because the idea is to sort of try to eliminate human error, like hand-configured, hand-crafted CLI kind of thing? Yeah, it definitely, the human error that's involved in there, and then also our network changes, but it changes very slowly over the years. And so that digression between older hardware and newer hardware, we need to account for that and ensure that it doesn't cause any problems moving down the line. Yeah, and on the wireless side, you know, one of the challenges we have is the constant influx of new devices into the network. So, you know, one medical team may buy some MRI machine, and it's a new MRI machine that's been approved, and the question is, how do they get it on the network? Sometimes these devices do not support .1x, so we're forced to use a PSK-type network. Mm. So one of the things I'm looking to do, right now we actually do allow PSK devices, um, but everything is role-mapped within our NAC solution. And, and a lot of times we're relying on Mac vendor OUI values, DHCP fingerprinting, and that's very unreliable with medical devices. So one thing we're looking to do is deploy sort of multi-PSK network, IPSK, the per device PSK. And the question is, how do you make a process that allows the clinical device team to onboard this device, get the unique PSK value, but still have the approval processes within our ticketing system. So that's kind of one area that we're looking to uh, get into. And that seems almost in some ways less like a risk mitigation and more like efficiency. Like the sooner we get this MRI on the network, the sooner we're scanning patients and providing service and so on. So they don't want to be bogged down with that ticket went in a week ago, where's my MRI machine? Yeah, and, and it's a source of frustration across across multiple teams because, you know, we need to make sure that the device is approved and there are systems that, that dictate whether that device is approved and whether it's approved for wireless. So you have that and we need to couple that with their need to get that machine online. They can't just be sitting there doing nothing. So trying to balance those two things and still have the proper approval mechanisms is really a challenge for us. On the data center segment side, uh, I do have it. Fortunately, I, I do have it uh, much less complicated than these two guys because these guys have to deal with multi-vendors, whereas I, fortunately, have to deal only with one vendor. So uh, reducing the, the human error um, is one big thing that, you know, particularly in the data center side, I try to uh, focus on and also have it uh, 
more you know symmetrical symmetrical deployment in in, in either of the data centers we are we are focusing about now we are actually venturing into new world with um, uh, virtualization in the data center in on the on the network fabric so we want to have it uh, more symmetrical deployment across the two data center fabrics so that the data center actually looks like one so that's that's uh, you know reducing human error as well as the, uh, the symmetrical aspects your network is like so many networks, it's a network of networks. It's a bunch of different networks. So, but the three of you are here together, the Network Automation Forum Autocon event. So are you thinking about automation individually? Like each of you have your own unique automation problems to solve? Or is part of the reason you're here together is because you're thinking about, could we all use the same automation solution? Yeah, I, I definitely would say that we're, we're looking to uh, aggregate all of the automation needs and challenges under a centralized platform. I've been watching the automation space for quite some time now and, and leveraging some of the tools that are out there, but I keep running up against that kind of bulwark of, you know, or that wall of where's the automation going to be sourced from and how is it going to get out to our devices in the same way? You know, just on the campus side, we have three main ven vendors for our um, distribution and access layer switches. Centralizing the automation solution. So in terms of centralizing the automation solution, we have these three different vendors in our distribution access layer switches. And for them, we have to write the same types of policy compliance checks three different times over. And thankfully, we have one place that actually runs from, but that doesn't work for Max aside, that doesn't work for Pradeep side. So we need something that will actually aggregate all of that, all three different areas and platforms into a centralized source so that what the work that we're doing gets deployed out in the exact same fashion, regardless of which area we're going to be in. So does that look like one orchestration solution that unifies three different automation sets of tooling maybe? Most likely, yeah. Most likely, because each one of each one of these areas have different tools that provide some similar functions, but a lot of specific things to that platform. And we also need to integrate with, you know, ServiceNow for ticketing, a uh, logic monitor for our monitoring platform, and being able to have that integration between what we're doing for automation and those other business needs is paramount. So what are the roadblocks then to getting that sort of full automation vision? Is it that sort of the one product doesn't exist or is it procedures and processes in-house? Is it compliance issues? Is it like, is it training? What's Just to touch base on the previous question, yeah. uh, I certainly echo the central, you know, whatever the, the tool that would solve the, that issues. But there's also a couple things, a couple takeaways for me is basically uh, understanding the the culture of automation, like what 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 it means and the principles of automation. That's something that I'm, you know, I'm. Um, the reason I say that is because uh, I'm at work. I, I'm I'm known as the guy who killed CLI for a week. <laughs> so um, <laughs> and <laughs> so I, I I certainly want to get away from that and and trying to understand the principles of automation and see how it can fit into our culture and and see what the roadblocks are. And, uh, and and start the journey from here. But I think that word culture is really apt because based on what I'm hearing here and from other conversations I've had, it is a significant change from how things were done or are done sort of by hand. Yes, we do have a pretty diverse team. Um, that So that's why some of the challenges are, you know, people trying to adapt to, you know, new tools and technologies and all of that. And, you know, throwing automation into, into it is, is a little challenging to say the least. So, you know, just getting the fundamentals right <laughs> instead of provoking people is one key uh, item for me to take away from, from this conference. I've also found that a lot of vendors, they, they want to sell, sell you their tool, their solution. This is how we do it. Meanwhile, they're basically sell, selling you a tool. Here is a screwdriver. Here is a hammer. Okay, well, I want to know what I need to do with this hammer or what problem am I solving that I could then apply the correct tool to. I think it's just getting out of the the mindset of using the CLI for everything. And and that's a very tough habit to break for, for most people because for myself, I learned on the CLI and I'm comfortable in the CLI. And when something breaks and I don't know what to do, I will go to the CLI. And 
I'm sure everyone else generally feels that way. So it's, it's just being able to be open to going to a software type development is really difficult. Are you talking about troubleshooting? Or are you talking about making a change? Both. Because I see, I see those as different things, right? Because I could see getting in the mindset of to make a change, I must change the code block in the GitHub repo, you know, push that, it gets approved, and then the pipeline sees that there's been a change and then pushes it to the affected device and kind of getting used to that mindset over time. But troubleshooting, it's like, eh, yeah, I'm still going to go to the CLI because that's where I can get the right show commands that tell me the things I need to know to, to fix a problem. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And I, I think for us, you know, it, I don't see what we use, what, what we'll try to use for wireless being any different than the data center or the campus. I think the the issue is that we need to be able to get all of the data into a centralized place, and then you can start to do things with it. Right now, we have all these different systems, and none of them talk to each other, whether it's the ticketing system, whether it's the controllers we use for wireless, or the different vendors we use for access layer and distribution layer. So they all have different methods of consuming that data. And we don't really have, I think, the way to start, and I guess I'll learn what the way to start is, but I feel like you, you need to be able to consume that data into a central place first. Okay, you're coming from the Wi-Fi perspective. This is really interesting to me because, to me, Wi-Fi and Wi-Fi controllers were on the forefront of the that more centralized model of network management where you stopped you didn't really manage individual APs. You manage everything through a controller and what the SSIDs are going to be and yep. all the security credential or uh, security scheme and all the rest of it. And so I think you'd be very comfortable with that model because it's almost like the rest of the networking world is catching up to what wireless started over a decade ago. And I think from the standpoint of the configuration of the controllers, yeah. we, we are there. Yeah. You know, we, we don't have an automated process of deploying um, across our controllers. And we do have some config drift within our controllers. But for the most part, when we push a policy, we push it to all of our controllers at the same time. So, you know, we're getting there. We're not doing something on a single controller. We're doing it to our entire environment. Um, but we don't have an automated way of doing that at this point. Okay. Do you have a vision of what a fully automated network environment would look like? Like, what does that mean to you when you think about in the future, here's what I'm going for? Yeah, it's it's definitely an evolution of, of of the process. And like to what you were getting at, Ethan, with the troubleshooting going right to the CLI, you can also automate the initial troubleshooting on the network device itself just by running a script. You know, you trigger off a condition and here's a whole bunch of show commands and save all the files off to a TFTP server. TFTP, I'm dating myself. Um, <laughs> off to another <laughs> server. Um just so you have that information before anyone's even actually logged into a device. So, you know, I, back when we started our NAC project, to kind of speak for this evolution and this kind of golden config of automation, I would have, I would have loved to get to a point where someone comes into our network, plugs in a device, let's just say a computer for this, you know, for this point, um, plugs it in, and now the automated processes take over to get that device registered onto our network associated with a with a, an individual and then onto the correct VLAN so that they can start working all without all of that manual effort gone so that's kind of the from that perspective a great golden golden configure where we want to get to that vision same thing for the rest of the network you know I'd like to get a switch plugged into the network plugged in not through a management port but through its fiber uplinks have it pull down its configuration provision itself based upon the, I'm going to say source of truth, but storage of what we've already provisioned that device for. Um, and then, you know, great. It's now ready to have hosts plugged into it. And actually on the, on the wireless side, on the SD-WAN side, we, we do um, have that type of automation. So we have dynamic ports on our switches that pull down configuration via radius. So the question there is not the fact that we have uh, dynamic port configuration, but what are the sources that are being used to validate those devices? So whether we, we're looking at Active Directory DNs to make sure that the device is in the proper OU and then granting access that, to that device, um, that's one thing on the corporate side. On the medical side, we're still working. But, you know, generally um, on, on the SD-WAN side, it, it is automated for port configurations. And that's been, that's been helpful. 
I will say that the one caveat is making sure that you have buy-in from other engineers, that they know that this is the way that it works. It's not the same as what it is. And that's always, you know, a challenge in, in changing the way that you do um, edge port configuration and things like that. Yeah, for me, the, the journey would be, uh, obviously we're on the right journey in terms of provisioning stuff in the data centers. But uh, the, uh, the next step in, in that automation journey would be getting the basic facts of the network, right? So when there's a P1, people want to know if something is done, right? So uh, automating uh, basic uh, show commands, uh, troubleshoot, you know, troubleshooting commands, whether it's in the data center fabric or on the, on the campus fabric, getting to know that basic facts and, and you know, displaying those results would be the next step in that evolution. So you see automation as providing you more visibility on sort of the state of the network? Exactly, exactly. And again, today we do we do do that um, between multiple tools. We have to jump from multiple tools, right? Um, but again, if you have a centralized automation platform that can give us basic facts of the network, the current state of the network would be would be a good thing to have. So would that be a script that kicks off automatically in reaction to a network condition, a down state or a degraded state? Yeah, again, that's a, that's a pretty big step in, in towards that journey. But the basic thing right now for us to be able to push a button that can run those scripts on on the you know, the WAN WAN switches, for example, run run that uh, run basic show commands and flag if there's a BGP neighbor down or OSPF neighbor down, or you know if there's a MAC flap somewhere. Uh, so that that would be that would be the initial step for us in terms of the troubleshooting aspect of the automation. Let's pause for a message from our sponsor, Interoptic. Interoptic is the optical transceiver and cable specialist that maximizes your IT savings while minimizing network failures. Interoptic provides high-performing optics at a fraction of the price of brand name optics. The Interoptic experts can help you spec the best optical transceivers and cables for your network environment. Interoptic optical transceivers are 100% guaranteed to be operationally equivalent with Cisco, Juniper, Extreme, Arista Brocade Palo Alto, and many other switches and routers. Due to Interoptic's deep optical transceiver technical experience, they can ensure that all messages, alerts, alarms, and threshold data are equivalent to OEM brands. Interoptic deploys rigorous 100% testing on their devices before they're shipped. Interoptic optical transceivers are built to the exact same quality standards as the OEMs and typically come from the exact same manufacturing lines. That's why insurance companies, retailers, financial services, and federal and state government customers deploy optics and cables from Interoptic. You can purchase the same, if not better performing, optical transceivers tested and backed up by real engineers at a fraction of OEM costs. Find out more at interoptic.com slash packet pushers. That's interoptic.com slash packet pushers. And now back to the podcast. So serious question. Doesn't AI and AI ops, isn't that where, isn't that the ultimate answer to, to the, the situation you just posed? So rather than building a bunch of scripts, wouldn't you want a solution that gathers all that data and then artificial intelligence actually can tell you the answer to that rather than you building a bunch of scripts and you look at the results and go, oh, we have a link down over here or this BGP neighbor just is flapping or whatever it is. Well, yeah, I mean, if there is that uh, golden tool out there, then we'll certainly implement that. <laughs> but uh, as as a journey, as an individual for myself, right, the, the journey would be, okay, what do I do in terms of a short term to you know, to get those basic facts out. But if there is a tool out there which doesn't cost million dollars, then we would certainly adapt, adapt I, into I a network. I don't know about cost, but we, we've been talking to some vendors that th this stuff is real now, okay. finally. It's oh. actually getting there. All right. um, you mean it stopped hallucinating? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. But but I can say that's, that is where we're, where we're finally getting there with AI Ops, where I've been talking to some vendors where the products they have brought to market make the AI ops thing actually real, as opposed to we're calling it AI, but what's really happening is we're doing statistical analysis and telling you when something deviates significantly from baseline and, and good luck figuring out what that all means. They're actually gathering the data from multiple sources and multiple points on the network, logs, and maybe it's SNMP data, and maybe it's telemetry, and, and et, et cetera, et cetera. And then figuring out what that actually means and percolating up to you, you have a problem and this is the root cause of the problem where it's something that's actionable that you can actually go there and then figure it out rather than, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with, we need to automate this, the information gathering so that it all, you know, gives us the information. And then a human looks at it and comes up with the answer to the problem. 
Yeah, right. Everybody's got to be there. Because what if the tool does cost a million dollars and that's not in your budget? You got to go with something. But I think the answer for the industry is actually AI, AI that can meaningfully make sense of the data that is in your network, analyze it very quickly and give you that answer in, in real time or near real time so that you can do something about it. I don't want to have to press the button and uh, have it have the script run and then tells me a thing and then I figure it out. I want AI to do that for me. That's a really good point. Like we obviously as network engineers, we, we want to lessen the burden of troubleshooting uh, basic stuff, right? So we definitely want to look out for tools that, that can do that. Um, but uh, again, every network is different. Like the the... Uh, the topology is different, the network is different, the underlying uh, facts are different. Uh, I've seen instances of that on the Cisco DNA where it tells you uh, where in the, the wireless, uh, you know, uh, where, where is the wireless issue, right? Whether it's a bad signal to noise ratio or whatever, um, or, or if it's an authentication issue or whatever, right? Um, I've, seen, I've seen that, um, um, but um, I have to look out for a tool that does actually um, look at the data and, and tell us, okay, here is what's happening. Yeah. So it sounds like you've got sort of little pockets of automation, like you mentioned some scripting, there's the wireless controllers, there's SD-WAN, you can do dynamic ports. Um, it sounds like in the data center you've got scripts where you can provision switch pretty quickly. So how do you, like, how do you bridge that gap from we've got some scripts to we've got a CICD pipeline and we've got sources of truth and we're doing a you know, code check in and check out and we're reviewing this program, you know, we've got our playbooks and how do you get there? Well, that's what we're hoping to find out in these two days. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's, you know, these, so before this conference, um, they, there was a net DevOps day in New York city that we attended where some of the same people are, uh, had presented and it's great to see what other organizations have done along their journey to, to not only learn from them, but also to interact with them and share with them. So like what, what we've learned. And I think that's the only way we can actually figure out how it's going to end up going, what direction we're going to go in for, for the, for the hospital system. Um, yeah, I can't think of any other way to make that happen. Uh, I, I think, you know, it, it really starts with, with buy-in, from, from the rest of the organization. So, you know, automating s common, simple tasks of VLAN change and IP registration, things like that, I think, give you the, the buy-in from, from others to say, okay, this is actually reducing workload on staff. If you can show that you're reducing workload on staff and you're actually creating some value by automating, then, you get more credit to start, you know, moving up from the access layer to start yeah. automating the distribution, start, you know, automating routing changes, things like that. But it has to start, in, in my view, it has to start with those really common tasks. And it also sounds like the you've got a couple of different constituencies you need buy-in from. There's the network engineering team that has to be on board with this, and then there's sort of the broader business who's like, yeah, we're going to invest in and let you take risks with automation. Is that accurate? Yeah, I would say so. Um, you know, even, even within buy-in within the network team itself is a, is a big portion. You know, we can, we can automate the generation of a ticket to, to then go and fix something. And that's great. But now we have 30,000 tickets that have just flooded everyone's queue. And I was like, okay, great. I'll just pick the next one off, I'll pick the next one off. So that that automation is is wonderful to have, but even within the team, we need to be able to to limit it. Say, all right, here are the first things we're going to be sending tickets off. Solve these problems. You know, we have out of spec uh, code running on these particular devices. Let's kick that off first, and then solve the next issue after that. As a as a network team, we all have full workloads. You know, and it it never it it seems to never get easier. You know, I, I like that one meme that, that, that was posted up where it said, I want automation. I want to automate my mundane tasks so I can continue to do more mundane tasks. <laughs> I, I'm afraid that's what it's going to be, but you know, it's, it's, it's going to take a, a lot of ground level buy-in. And then ultimately when we can give a high level of confidence to our management to say, 
we've done this and we're continuing to do this on a 100% basis, they, they'll feel hopefully um, strong enough to say like, okay, yeah, go to the next step. We really need the confidence to, for um, non-technical staff and, and others to be able to believe what the state of the network is from the tools that it's showing it, right? If, if the network's saying A, we have to believe that it's actually true. Mm -hmm. And that's always a, a struggle. Well, okay, the, the network is saying that, as in you've got some monitoring tool, a network monitoring station telling you that? Correct. Okay, so we're consuming, we're just doing SNMP polling, we're consuming telemetry? What, what For the is most the part, yes, doing? SNMP and telemetry. Yeah, okay. Why would we not believe that? I believe it. <laughs> but you're saying there are people in the, non-technical, you said non-technical people in the organization who... Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's being able to declare the network innocent. Okay, so you're saying there's... There's a problem somewhere, and everybody who's not on the networking team is like, oh, it must be the network, when you're like, no, this application is not responding or whatever, or it's very slow. It's or whatever like it is. Uh, okay. And you say, well, look at the stats, and they're like, I don't believe you. Correct. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, you're coming at it from the opposite way, you know, and, and, uh, proof of innocence. I was thinking of like, well, if, the, if it says there's a degraded state, I believe that. You know, you're saying, okay, th everything's green, everything's fine, there's nothing that we're consuming from the network as far as telemetry that's telling us there's a problem, we don't have a problem. Instead, you got to go and improve it, which has been the bane of the network engineer for forever. Someone doesn't understand why the network is, or why the application is slow. It's presumed to be the network, even though it's... Fine, here's the Wireshark trace that shows that the database took half a second to respond to your query. Geez, no wonder things are stacking up in your queue. That thing's dying. Well, that's why you need the Layer 4 guy, right? Because the uh, the network guys point to their dashboard and it shows all green. The system guys point to their dashboard and it says all green. And then they're like, well, why isn't it working? So, yeah. Although occasionally it is the network, actually. <laughs> it does happen. It does. It does happen from time to time. <laughs> sure, but every application vendor, their code is perfect. There's no problems with their code <laughs> Obviously. or the version of the browser they're running it on or the, you know, the integration between the back end system. No problems there. The one thing I actually uh, I keep joking around within my team is basically every application, I guess I don't know modern applications, but, you know, old applications, and if any any time there's a disconnect between app server versus D, uh, to DB, there's always uh, a comment or whatever error that shows up as check with network administrator, and that's why you know network has always to be blamed and you know uh, <laughs> prove the prove the innocence basically, yeah. and uh, that's that's uh, yeah. <laughs> so Pradeep, I got a specific question for you since you're dealing with the data center side of the network. Do you see? a situation where you would make your network, you'd want it to be self-service, that is the people deploying applications in the data center could just hit a service catalog that you've published to them and then uh, the network would be provisioned in accordance with that service catalog so they could deploy their app. So again, I, I don't really deal with app deployment per se. Okay. Um, let's take, but I can extrapolate that example with switch deployment, right in the data center. The, the automation tool is there to deploy 200 racks or 300 racks in the data center today. Um, but again, I would, uh, as a network engineer, I would have to go in and, and press those buttons to to do that. Whereas I would envision uh, uh, sometime in the future where as soon as the DCIM is populated with those two switches, and if those are brand new switches, and it should kick off a workflow with the tool, with the uh, deployment tool, to basically deploy the uh, switches in the data center. Because the, the tool itself is, is accounted for all the IP addressing schemes, ASN numbers, and all of that, right? So that's that's a workflow I envision in the future, but not 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 anything soon. And you'd be comfortable with that if that workflow existed. You'd be comfortable to turn someone loose and say, "Yeah, we've already built the workflow. Press the buttons, answer the questions, do the thing. Call me if you have a problem." Yeah, definitely. I take an example there. Ten years ago, when I started doing network, um, you know, net as a network engineer, I always used to. You know, when I assign a point-to-point -point, uh, you know, IP address, I always used to check the network if the point-to-point -point is available or not. But with automation, you know, uh, we we assigned these hundred racks; they are pre-provisioned in the in the script or in the tool already. So I'm at this point, I'm really comfortable to say, okay, if these are if there's a brand new rack that's being deployed with two switches in there, I would let let the tool, you know, the DCIM tool, talk to the automation tool to basically deploy in the data center. I'm pretty comfortable with that. All three of you have mentioned 
tools as opposed to saying, I'm writing scripts in my own, you know, I'm in Python or whatever your chosen language might be. So are you believers more in tools that you consume from a vendor as opposed to uh, a Python script, let's say, that you write yourself? So way back in the day, there was a, net, well, not a network automation, but a network monitoring project that was deployed across the hospital. The person that deployed it shortly then after left. Mm -hmm. The people that were there to maintain it, maintained it to the best of their ability. And then it just died on the vine. And so from the perspective of providing a good service to the hospital itself, we need, we kind of would rather have a vendor's equipment in there um, rather than roll our own. Because rolling our own, now you're managing that server, you're managing that disk, you're managing every single piece of it. Um, whereas, and if that person leaves, that, in, that knowledge base has gone with them. You know, and, and other people have to now skill up to get to that point. With a vendor, we have a little bit more leeway to say, all right, we've placed the tool in place. It does all of these things. If we need to extend it, we can now work with the vendor to do so. So it sounds like one of the things I'm hearing is that, you know, that there's folks who have scripts and an individual runs them and knows them and maintains them. The next step is, are you comfortable letting somebody else run those scripts? And that's sort of like a, a step in the journey. And then the next step is, well, let's put all those scripts in a repository and they can be checked in and checked out and we can uh, track them and audit them and so on. That's the next step. But it sounds like you are maybe wanting to go instead of that journey more like, let's get a bunch of vendor tools and then find a way to make them work together and have a, a layer on top to orchestrate that? Yeah, for me, I, that, that seems to be one of the more appealing ways of, of automating. Uh, a lot of times these, uh, these systems that we have do have APIs. So, um, you know, we have developers. Um, I personally have not engaged those developers to see what the possibilities are of integrating the tools, um, but there are, or rather integrating those APIs together, um, whereas, you know, just as I mentioned before, having the ticket system, as well as perhaps NAC and the IPAM solution, all, all working together to complete a workflow. So something that appeals to me is an easy way of marrying those APIs together. Okay, so something that's orchestrating all the API calls that have to happen in a workflow. Yeah, the, the scripting part. I, I, I don't know if you remember, Mark, but uh, before the SD-WAN solution actually became a reality in our enterprise, we did some scripting in terms of uh, deploying or writing a script that can deploy, a self-serve uh, script that can deploy 100 or 150 sites uh, in the network. But again, um, that's that knowledge of that script is basically tied to one engineer, right. and if that engineer leaves the organization, right. it will be trouble for the other other folks to basically pick up and say, "Okay, what is it doing? I need to, um, you know, deploy 50 more sites. What do I do now?" Right. That's the knowledge that has to get extracted from that person and put into a repository. And it's and, not and just the repository. It's it's yeah. I mean, it is repository. I mean, I guess I st the, the 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 script still is on my um, <laughs> laptop. <laughs> Uh, it, it's not uh, it's not on Git or anywhere. Yeah. Um, but the the other thing is that the the knowledge of putting together that script actually lives in my brain. It's not it's not the the the, the principles of software engineering where you comment out every single line of code is mm. not what I'm good at, and that's not I you know I did some um, Java or C plus plus back in my day. So is that knowledge sort of like? some kind of like business intent or the, the variables that have to go in to make the script work? What is it that it needs to be extracted from the human to make sort of a, a script that anybody can run? Well, anybody can run, yes, because the, the script has to be um, like a self-serve tool or self-serve basically. But the other thing is also like how do you uh, take the script and modify a few things within the script to basically, because the network Obviously, the policies or the configuration changes a lot, right? Okay. The, the the script might be good for a year and year and year and couple of years, but after that, what do you do and what do you change and and you know how do you make it work? That's something again as a culture we would have to uh, uh, you know accumulate to that, like understand. Okay, here is one, here is a journey that we are on, and here is how how it is working and all of that. Well, and, and the joke about that is. It if your code is like mine, even if you comment every single line and try to remind yourself what the variable is, and you know, this dictionary structure in Python, I set it up like this and it accomplishes this, and this is how you populate it. If you're looking at it six months later, reading your own comments, you're going, 
how does it, it feels fragile? How do I do that again? You know, let alone some other party trying yeah. to look at what you wrote and read your comments and try to make sense of it. It's all, uh, it's all, it's all difficult. So Mark, going back to your comment, like, yeah, if I got a vendor tool, then I can rely on the vendor then and, and, and their tool and someone's going to be maintaining it. Plus it's much more usable as opposed to a script written by a network engineer who maybe wasn't trained in good software development principles it's not especially modular. It's a little bit clunky how you implement it. It's a little bit fragile how you implement it. Maybe there's not good input checking there. Okay, there's probably not good input checking there. <laughs> not maybe, <Yep>. probably. <laughs> and, and, and so on. All of that is, uh, is tough as opposed to you know, the, the vendor tool. Yeah, well, I, I would have to assume that, and, and this is I, you know, based upon my own experience, that a lot of the code that I've written has been to solve a particular problem I had at that moment of time. Mm. It was never, I can write this code and now I could extend it throughout time. And you know, you, you talk scripts, not everyone has the same scripting environment built out there. Not everyone knows how to use Py and ENV to, to stand that up. And so handing them a script, <laughs> it, you know, might they'll be like, I can't execute this. I don't know what's going on. Now, you know, Go kind of, helps a little bit more in that because it kind of helps structure your code. And now I can take that executable and share it to anyone. They don't need a particular environment. It all comes along with the yeah. Go execu executable. Um, but the a vendor sponsored tool is it kind of, I feel like it gives the, the business um, a better foundation to rely upon rather than the individual engineer that has put something together to solve the problem. And is more portable from engineer to engineer. Yet we're a X shop using this particular uh, automation tool. And if you don't know it, we can, we can teach it to you. As opposed to, do you know Python? We've been hoping someone could figure out Bob's script from three years ago. You know, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, okay, so maybe a closing question here for the three of you. You've been, you're here at, uh, at, at AutoCon Zero. What are you hoping to come away with? Are there specific, like, actionable things, or is it more of the exploratory, how's everybody else doing it and trying to get your heads around it? I'm actually interested in not only taking away information from it, but also providing some, too. One of the main things I've, I've never seen yet so far in these repositories of, you know, scripts to do this or Ansible playbooks to do that is the process database, how do you do X in the best way? How do you validate that your configuration change is actually running in, in production properly? What show commands do you run? And <laughs> building out that script and for, for various things is something that I would rather do now. And I'd rather, you know, hand it back to everyone saying, here's what I have. Can we modify it? Is there any problems with it? Can anyone else add to it? Um, that I think will go a long way to saying, here are the problems we need to solve and then start applying the tools on how to solve those. I, I'm laughing because to me, in some degree, that is environment specific. Like, like what the testing commands I might run to validate that a change worked could be different for an environment I support versus what you guys are facing in your specific scenario. Well, it's definitely vendor but, specific. And, and that. Yeah. Yeah. And that. What about you, Pradeep? Yeah, so again, the uh, one thing that I already mentioned is that um, uh, there's a couple of things. One, one is basically where the industry is at and what sort of tools are, are currently that we can, uh, you know, take, uh, take and, and hit the ground running as, as opposed to build everything, you know, start from scratch or, you know, start from ground zero. Uh, so that's something uh, I'm, I'm, you know, those are the th couple of things that I'm willing to take away from this conference. Yeah, and for me, uh, it's mostly exploratory, but I, I, I really want to understand how other companies are having those different APIs interact with, with each other and to, to build those, those processes that are currently um, manual and frustrating for all parties. Okay. Well, guys, thank you for the discussion. You were as open as you as you could be, you know, reasonably. Yeah, I know we couldn't get into too many specifics about your environment, which is uh, which is entirely fair. Uh, are you guys uh, social creatures? Like, Mark, you out on LinkedIn or somewhere where people could reach out to you? I'm um, definitely on LinkedIn. Yeah. Okay. And, yeah, I'm on LinkedIn, and I have a blog, WiFlyMax at dot wordpress dot com. Excellent. Yeah, I'm I'm on LinkedIn as well. 
Excellent. Okay, well, we'll have the links in the show notes up on packetpushers.net if you want to reach out to these guys and share with them either what you're doing or ask them questions about, uh, about what, what they're doing in their shop. And uh, we'd like to thank you for listening today to Heavy Networking. We have many more fine, free technical podcasts all up at packetpushers.net. You can go to our subscribe page and find our current lineup of shows. And, uh, and of course, if you don't want to hit the web because that feels old-fashioned to you, fine, look in your podcatcher and uh, search for Packet Pushers and you'll find all the shows there. We, we have a lot of shows uh, out now. If you haven't been paying attention because you only subscribe to, say, Heavy Networking, well, then you're missing out on Network Break and Kubernetes Unpacked and uh, Day 2 Cloud, which I host with uh, Ned Bellavance and, uh, and several other shows that are in the lineup. we got a new security show. If we haven't launched it yet, we'll be launching it soon. That'll be coming up in the next... Uh, a few weeks or months. And uh, last but not least, remember that too much networking would never be enough.